So yeah, without further ado, I would love to introduce you all to Mr. Salim Asad. It's honestly a pleasure. Um, Salim is uh, is a really you know fantastic journalist, and, and we're so happy to have him here with us. So. Uh, so to give you a little bit of background about Salim and who he is, um, Salim Asad is an international reporter working in media for the past decade, covering news and feature stories for outlets, including Time Magazine, CNN, NHK World, AFP, and the AP. In 2018, he began working for Euro News as the lead reporter in its weekly program uh, from the region called Inspire Middle East. Based in Abu Dhabi, he explores the latest happenings in the MENA region's technology, business, and cultural scene to highlight people breaking the mold for an international audience, and he has helped produce more than 80 episodes. His career saw him cover happenings from across the globe, including women's citizenship rights in Jordan, protests over the relocation of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in 2017. He's investigated New York's uh, secret surveillance policies over Arab and Muslim Americans, covered world events, such as the trial of former Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi and the terror attacks of the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, working as an editor at the live news desk. Salim holds his bachelor's degree in Arabic and Japanese from UCLA and his master's degree in broadcasting from the Columbia School of Journalism in New York. So honestly, it's just a pleasure to have you here with us, Salim. I know that you have so much experience and background to share with us. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. And, uh, you know, this is always a pleasure. I mean, you know, I'd like to be, be able to communicate, you know, what I'm doing and you know, also with aspiring journalists. And uh, actually, I mean, that's one thing I wanted to ask you about as well. Uh, I mean, this is hopefully going to be more of an inform informal talk, just kind of share my experience. Um, you know, if you have interest about like reporting in the region, things that you might face. Um, yeah, so hopefully, like what I'll do, uh, you know, at the beginning, is just kind of give a background about maybe like perspectives, uh, you know, and viewpoints, you know, from, you know, as, a, as that I have as a reporter and, you know, that like, um, you know, we've seen in, uh, on media platform, and then, you know, go into like a Q&A uh, session after that. And, uh, you know, as Kitty was saying, like my current job right now is, uh, you know, I work for that program called Inspire Middle East, which I really like because it, it shows, <clears throat> it shows like Middle East voices in a different way that you don't necessarily see in mainstream, uh, you know, English language media. So, uh, yeah, so I think I come from a, you know, good perspective, you know, at, at, at this point in my career when before, you know, I've worked for uh, various organizations. So I'll start by showing a few clips where, I mean, I might be dating myself, uh, but, you know, with, like, you all know Aladdin though, I'm, I'm sure, uh, no matter how old you are, like the, the old version, not the, uh, not the live version, the actual cartoon one. So, uh, I'm starting with that because it's something that's a cartoon, supposed to be fun, but you can see embedded in, you know, different types of media, whether news or entertainment, that there are these like hidden, maybe non-intentional, but, you know, very uh, misleading, uh, you know, hints of viewpoints and, and, and uh, I guess, viewpoints on identities, but then also what we as a society allowed to pass. So I'll share my screen real quick to share that. One moment. Oh, and sorry, the person who's speaking in this video is Jack Shaheen. He is a uh, Arab American who uh, created the documentary Real Bad Arabs, if you're familiar with it. I believe it was in 2001. And it, it basically, uh, he did an analysis of, you know, different movies, uh, you know, from, you know, entertainment to, uh, I believe, like some newscasts as well, that where there were like these hidden types of representations needed in, uh, of uh, Arab, uh, you know, the voices, uh, images and things like that. And um, he basically did an analysis of it to reflect, you know, the biases that lay in the mainstream media. So I'll play a little clip of that and share my screen. Oh, I come from a land, from a faraway place where a caravan of camels rolls. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Now, how could a producer with a modicum of intelligence, just a modicum, of sensitivity. Let a song such as that open the film. But this moves way beyond one song. You must be hungry. 
Here you go. Be able to pay for that. Do you know what the penalty is for stealing? No, please. The Arab's one-dimensional caricature, cartoon cutouts used by filmmakers as stock pillows and as comic relief. I mean, so that was a uh, like very direct negative, you know, portrayal of uh, you know like Arab image. And I mean, it's okay to be critical of course, but I mean, this is a cartoon where it's just, they're introducing a fantasy land and then, you know, you have, you know, things like that. Later on, they actually, I believe, removed, you know, the cut off your ears if they don't like your face uh, part in the future because of his work. But uh, there are also like, uh, like uh, other representations, for example, in, um, in Community, that's the scene that was playing right there, where, I mean, you know, the intention is, well, they have a Palestinian character, but, but then it's like they don't even make the effort to find someone who can pronounce Arabic words properly. And it's, it's almost like mocking it by not putting any effort. Like you wouldn't, you, I don't think you'd ever see this for, uh, you know, the same thing done, you know, if you had like a different, you know, ethnic community and it would be passable. So I'll play that part so you can see it. Yeah, so that one actually is, uh, could be offensive to someone, you know, uh, someone who's Muslim and he's saying, was it, uh, like I think he actually says instead of Alhamdulillah, which is extremely offensive um, <laughs> to someone's faith. So little things like that, you know, that even though they're well-intentioned, they're trying to show, you know, different voices, different religions, but it's, uh, you know, just shows like the lack of consideration. So this is sometimes something that you deal with, uh, you know, in media and as a journalist, like you're seeing uh, sometimes both sides of it. And so what I showed just there was, uh, you know, those three clips, those are from entertainment. Here's something that's, you know, from news media. Uh, you know, of course, Fox News is known uh, to have certain viewpoints, but I thought this discussion was very interesting. It's a bit blatant, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, in my opinion, I would say, like the viewpoints of the, uh, of the presenter. Uh, but I'll let you judge for yourself and just to hear the conversation. And I would say, like, and pay attention to the, um, I guess, the comfort that the presenter has in asking these questions, you know, so deliberately. And think about if, you know, this would be okay when you're speaking to other minority groups or ethnicities. This is an interesting book. Now, I want to clarify, you're a Muslim, so why did you write a book about the founder of Christianity? Well, to be clear, I am a scholar of religions with four degrees, including one in the New Testament and fluency in Biblical Greek, who has been studying the origins of Christianity for two decades, who also just happens to be a Muslim. So it's not that I'm just some Muslim writing about Jesus. I am an expert with a PhD in the history of religions. Uh, but but, but I've been obsessed question, with Jesus. Though, it still begs the question, why would you be interested in the founder of Christianity? Taylor Kane um, just says, uh, so your book is written with clear bias and you're trying to say it's academic. That's like having a Democrat write a book about why Reagan wasn't a good Republican. Is It, it, it just doesn't work. Well, what do you say would, to that? It would be like, it would be like a Democrat with a PhD in Reagan who has been studying his life and history for two decades writing a book about Reagan. But then why would, Again, why would a Democrat want to promote democracy by writing about a Republican? I mean, I, mean, I, well, I see that the assuming, point is, is that... Ma'am, may I just, may I just yeah, finish ahead. my sentence for a moment, please? I think that the fundamental problem here is that you're assuming that I have some sort of faith-based bias in this work that I write. I write about Judaism. I write about Hinduism. I write about Christianity. I write about Islam. My job as a scholar of religions with a PhD in the subject is to write about religions. And one of the religions that I have written about is the religion Reza, that was you're not just writing about Jesus. a religion from a point of view of an, uh, an, an observer. I mean, the thing about it is, is that, Why you're, 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 that? You're, 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 I thought that was a very powerful conversation. And, uh, you know, again, it just it shows, you know, the comfort of where she's coming from. Uh, you know, it seems like it's not something that's going to get a lot of uh, you know, rejection from, you know, mainstream communities. It, it did get a lot of uh, traction online. I think it's what raised uh, Reza Aslan as, you know, a commentator and then later on as a, uh, he had a program on CNN. But it's, you know, it's just those types of viewpoints where, you know, you have to, you know, as a uh, Middle, East, Middle Eastern man, he basically has to fight to be able to 
have that opinion or as a scholar, you know, to speak about his viewpoints. And that's what the whole conversation was dominated by. I, I'm not sure how much of his book, you know, they actually talked about in, a academic, uh, in an academic manner. And this goes back to, you know, whatever your, uh, the field that you're working in is. And, you know, it's just to basically to, I mean, you're in the Middle East, or I mean, you, you know, you've come to the Middle East, you know, to learn Arabic, you know, you have that interest. And I think uh, understanding, you know, culture and how to properly represent people goes a very long way, whether you're, you're doing humanitarian work, whether you're working in media, whether you're, you're working one-on-one -on, -one on, you know, various types of projects. It's, you know, just something to always keep in mind, uh, you know, as you're dealing with any, you know, uh, minority population uh, when it comes to representation. Like, if, say, say, for example, when reporting stories, you get a lot of journalists that come to the Middle East that, you know, they want to get that, you know, like rough and tough story with a refugee and uh, to go to a camp and to, you know, really show that, you know, they went there and take a picture, hold someone and, you know, and do all that. I mean, some come well-intentioned, but, you know, they get to think about things um, such as, uh, like, for example, I just did a story that's uh, coming out tomorrow about uh, education and uh, we got a soundbite from uh, someone, from a student, you know, at the refugee camp uh, who's in Zaatari who's doing distance learning. So, you know, like sometimes you'll have pressure from your side to, you know, oh, you have to get a full name, you have to get as much about their identity as, as you can, but then you have to also understand, you know, th their situation where even if you don't grasp, you know, like what their, I mean, a lot of the times, you know, that's uh, the case I'm in where, you know, I, I don't know the exact, um, you know, threats that they face if their full name is out there, if they say a certain thing, if something is perceived wrong even by, you know, um, a government official or something like that, it could actually harm them. So, you know, even though you want to really get that story, you really want to get that information, and you mean well, you want to tell their story, you want to share it with the world to show something amazing that they're doing, you just have to really take that into consideration sometimes that you don't know everything that's involved. And, you know, the best way to find out is to ask. Uh, ask them directly, ask, you know, uh, like in, in this case, uh, it's, it's uh, with UNR uh, it's our UNHCR, uh, you know, who's managing the camp. So find out, you know, like what, what the rules are, how you can better protect, you know, the people that you're uh, telling stories of. And, and that's, and I don't want you to think that, you know, oh, you have to be on your toes all the time when talking about uh, stories or people from the Middle East. I think you can be very critical. You can, you can ask the hard questions as I think you should, uh, because, you know, that's, I mean, as a journalist, that's your role. And, uh, you know, sometimes when you, uh, if you're a researcher and you have to get that information, it's okay to do that. There's just a proper respectful way to do that, you know, to uh, still get that content while uh, maintaining, you know, that, that respect. So here's a clip, which, I mean, I think it's, they're talking about something, uh, you know, very intense, very sensitive, but I mean, you can even see in the, um, you know, from the lady's comments that she appreciates, you know, the way it's being asked, even though it's a TV program and they have to have that, you know, active banter, uh, you know, to get the excitement going. So I'll play that for you as well. My daughter to cover up, okay? But I completely respect this woman's right to do this. But I mean, you're, you're a very bright woman. You're a molecular geneticist, right? I mean, you're very, very smart, intelligent, thinking for yourself, woman. No man's told you to do this. You have decided you want to do that. Surely the feminist ideal, which I keep being told about, is women should be allowed and free to dress and behave how they choose, but you don't want this woman, Sahar, to choose her right to wear this. I completely respect Sahar's decision to do it, but I just don't think there is a feminist argument. Do you think it's appropriate, let's say, in this country that a woman wore the full face belt to teach primary school or to be in a police station? Do you think you, know, yeah. you need some face-to-face -face contact to make so, civic society function properly? Uh, so first of all, thank you yeah. for, for expressing that, because that's the truth. A lot of people yeah. never had the chance to speak to me. Yeah. And they think they've been socially conditioned by the negative stereotypes around Muslims in the media. Yeah. And they think someone like me is oppressed and, and uh, can't integrate and can't participate in the society. I, know. So, I mean, I thought that was a, obviously it was only a small part of it, but, you know, it was the beginnings of a, uh, or little tidbits of an interesting conversation where, you know, it's like, okay, you know, that uh, the lady, she expressed her viewpoint, says, you know, I'm a, I don't think this is a feminist, uh, you know, position at all. It's okay to say that. I mean, that's not offensive anyway, but, you know, they had, like, respectful banter. They didn't say that, 
oh no, uh, you know, you have no rights and I'm telling you what your rights are. And, you know, so I think that's a very healthy discussion and, you know, ones that we should have. And that's, you know, a good way to represent it during, uh, you know, in media. Uh, and, you know, with the stories that I do, uh, you know, I see the impact of how much uh, representation matters. So, uh, I mean, I won't play the note, but I mean, in the rest of the video, like I had just like different clips of, you know, stories of like representing, um, you know, like different types of, you know, Middle Eastern people. Like you have uh, a woman who wears a niqab, you know, as that, uh, as that lady did. Uh, you have, you know, women who are, you know, doing martial arts and, you know, there are different voices and that's the, kind of the responsibility I feel to, you know, um, you know, we're doing a weekly program and it's our role to properly represent the breadth of people that exist, not to shy away from showing someone who's more conservative, um, you know, and, and has and presents in a certain way. Actually, I mean, I probably will show that clip because I think just seeing, I'll show the contrast of like, you know, different people that are out there and then kind of, you know, what, what uh, impression does that leave on you? Uh, maybe this is something that you don't see as much in mainstream media of, you know, people with, you know, this uh, certain look, you know, speaking, publicly speaking on stuff that's not related to how they appear necessarily or being Arab or being a victim of war or being a refugee or something like that is, you know, a lot of the time, uh, you know, uh, topics about the Middle East focus on. So I'll play that real quick. Illustrating what youngsters respond to is Emirati children's book author, Meitha al Khayyat, drawing up the main character of her next picture book, Umi Moza, a grouchy woman who lives in the desert, eats beetles, and gets in trouble for meddling in her neighbor's affairs. The writer and artist of more than 160 books says children want reading material that speaks to them. They have antennas. They would know that if this book was, uh, for, that the whole uh, purpose of this book is to teach them instead of entertain them, then they'll definitely throw this book away. Starting out 10 years ago, Meithat says there were only a handful of Arabic children's book authors in the UAE. Creative books were mostly in English, she said. So there's one uh, person talk. she's a children's book author. Uh, you know, nothing to do with the way, you know, she presents herself, uh, you know, but, you know, just talking about her work uh, as an artist. And then, for example, here's a very different person. She's uh, an Iraqi jiu-jitsu fighter who, uh, I mean, you know, who's been like competing internationally and uh, her story wasn't as told uh, by media for some reason. So she was a great find. Not that Ashtar needs protection with her skills, for the 35-year-old is a martial artist and she turned to the Brazilian combat sport of jiu-jitsu for survival after becoming the victim of physical violence while living in Europe in her 20s. Feeling defenseless and frightened, she relocated to the UAE in 2011. I didn't leave my house for like two years. I would just go to the gym or to, to work and I would go home. And I was in a place where everything scared me. The martial art empowered Ashtar. Mastering joint locks and chokeholds, she learned to do more than protect herself. She became a competitive fighter on and off the mats. Well, that was when I from the US. <laughs> Actually, I don't think I can play that without letting that play out a, a little bit more. So this was a, uh, so this is now moving to the US side. Uh, the other two stories were from uh, Abu Dhabi. This was something I did in the US where it kind of like challenged Arab viewpoints about, uh, you know, Arabs in, you know, uh, in US society. So, um, play that a little bit. Expressing sexuality in public is considered taboo in most Arab societies. But in New York City, some Arab and Middle Eastern Americans are openly embracing it. I was craving community because there was this idea that uh, I could only be one identity at a time. Bashar Machai is Chaldean American, Catholic, and gay. When his sexuality became public, Machai says he found himself abandoned by his community. His mother gave him an ultimatum at 19, be straight or move out. I kissed her and I left. And that was it. But he struggled to find acceptance in American society after 9-11, where he said some couldn't separate Arab from terrorists. I wouldn't speak Arabic. I wouldn't uh, listen to Arabic music. I wouldn't do any of these things um, uh, because uh, I felt unsafe. Something Hilal Khalil also experienced. You know, there were no real resources, at, you know, at least in the career community um, for Arabs. There felt there was a lot of racism. So Machai created Tarab. Yeah. So... 
that's just to kind of show that, you know, it's okay to talk about like controversial things. And in that one, actually I had to like be very careful with the way I worded it. Uh, but I really liked the story because it, I felt like it addressed uh, both sides of things where, you know, they were saying that it's queer Arabs, that, uh, you know, they were completely rejected from their societies, one Muslim, one Christian. And, uh, you know, that's kind of the, almost the, the story almost that you expect to hear. But then, you know, what I think made it really interesting was then that they also faced discrimination the other way around, where in the queer community that they were viewed as an outsider, as being extreme, as being like too conservative, and they, uh, you know, face a lot of discrimination. So then that's why, uh, you know, those, uh, so uh, Bashar actually, the uh, first guy, he created Farab, an event where it's a more inclus inclusive environment. So, I mean, and I think this is where the power that you hold as a storyteller, where, uh, for example, like if uh, you don't tell these types of stories, a lot of the time, no one's going to hear it. Um, you know, with, with a lot of news nowadays, you see um, almost like copy paste journalism of like, you know, just uh, finding out like what, or just identifying what's out there, the news, uh, getting your reaction, and then, you know, the story's over. But, um, you know, as, you know, uh, people working in the humanitarian field where you're, literally like documenting people's stories and as a journalist where you're uh, sharing it with media as a researcher where, where as a journalist I'm looking to your work to find out that that data that information all of this kind of helps uh, you know to create that identity and uh, representation which uh, I think you can agree um, you know when it comes to minority groups representation is everything seeing something is relating seeing someone is relating relating to them and uh, so that's, you know, that's the main gist of, you know, the conversation here, like the power that you hold, you know, doing the work that you do. Uh, I'm going to show one more thing to share. Uh, this is like when, when operating in the Middle East as well, like uh, you have to also be realistic. Uh, uh, so this is a map, you know, by Reporters Without Borders and uh, Black actually represents where uh, there isn't much press freedom. So you, know, you also have to be realistic. Uh, that, you know, you are facing a lot when you are, are reporting in the region. There are a lot of obstacles um, in regards to access to information, what you're allowed and uh, allowed to do and uh, what you're not allowed to do. Uh, I've had, like, equipment confiscated many times, you know, for, uh, you know, traveling to certain countries and not filling out the exact paperwork or even so, you know, then you find out that, um, you know, there was a, it, you know, it's just a circumstantial thing where, you know, you're not allowed to report. So you do have to be, you have to calm your nerves a lot of times and, uh, you know, and, and just kind of know the environment you're in. It doesn't mean that, you know, that people don't want to work with you, but you just have to operate under the rules in the, of the country that you're working in. Uh, I mean, in my opinion is that uh, a lot of it is based on, um, you know, Arab culture of, you know, liking to save face where, you know, I feel that perspectives a lot of the time are around you know, why should I share bad things that are, you know, uh, that are happening when we're doing our best to improve society, to make, you know, all these changes uh, in the right direction. So it's just, it's more just about understanding, I think, than saying that, oh, you know, these people, you know, don't have press freedom. And, you know, as a uh, person coming from the outside, I think, you know, the more you try to understand people, understand their reasoning, it helps you to navigate a bit more. Like I was saying about the refugee camp, you know, where you might not understand why something's a threat or why is something is a security risk for someone, but, you know, to them it is. And, and that's what matters at the end of the day. And then, you know, you still have to do your job. So there's a way to navigate that, um, to find that common ground. So, yeah, I mean, I, I mean at this point, I mean, I'm curious to hear what you want to know, uh, but that's kind of been my experience, um, you know, working in the U.S., working in the Middle East, and, um, you know, like, and, and having, you know, these experiences, you know, with, uh, you know, from access to how do I represent someone properly? How do I tell a story that's interesting to someone, but at the same time, respect, respectful of the person I'm speaking to? Uh, you know, it's always a balance. So, uh, you know, if, uh, Katie's up for, you know, to open up the floor to, first of all, find out, uh, maybe if you can tell me a bit about, you know, what your backgrounds are, I can try and answer, you know, the best I can uh, in terms of, you know, like how information that I, I have can help. Um, yeah, and uh, I hope this was helpful in terms of uh, background information. Could you just briefly exp uh, explain the whole process of a story from start to finish, like what goes into it, how long does one story usually take, and uh, yeah, I'm just curious as to the whole procedure for that. Yeah, for sure, and I, I didn't touch on, on that at all. Um, 
Yeah, so I guess like the first thing you ask yourself is, you know, uh, when you have a story idea is why do people care? You know, is there something that, um, that you'd actually want to know? Um, so, uh, and so like, for example, like I did a story recently, you know, about cybersecurity. Uh, and it was, you know, during a time where, of course, everyone is, you know, working from home more, uh, internet usage was, uh, you know, increased like uh, exponentially. And, um, you know, people cared because they were doing it, they were putting themselves at risk uh, to, in, a lot, in a lot of ways that they didn't know. So, you know, then, uh, so you have that idea uh, versus, and yeah, there's a big distinction base between a story and a, an idea. So, you know, they say like an idea is just a unicorn, it's this fantastical thing that, uh, you know, isn't real, and a story is something that's real. Do you have something that's happening? Uh, do you have someone to speak to? Um, what's the problem? How are they overcoming the problem? These are all the things that make a story. It's kind of like a movie plot almost of, you know, you have to have, you know, the uh, climax, you have to have, you know, a character to start with. Um, you know, in my training, you know, you never start a story with numbers. People don't relate to numbers. They uh, relate to people and emotions. So, you, you know, start your story with a powerful lead, like saying that last story, you know, seeing a, uh, I believe he was a Syrian, American uh, man in drag, you know, performing uh, in New York City, singing an Arabic song. It has that, you know, a bit of a shock value. It, it, you know, it gets your attention and then you get introduced to a human being who suffered, you know, from to society. So that's kind of like what you want to think about, you know, like the human story. And then you go into the facts, you talk about communities, you can talk about numbers, uh, like what they call the nut graph, you know, going bigger, talking about, you know, the uh, you know, the impact on society, or, uh, you know, if you have uh, statistics, you know, from the World Bank, from uh, the UN, that really puts it into context, because then if you just have a personal story without, you know, the saying the why it matters on a larger scale, then, you know, it, it can, it would just be like anecdotal, and, uh, you know, a nice profile, but not necessarily a new story, and I think that would extend, you know, like to different forms, you know, of uh, even research, you know, you use anecdotes, you use case studies, to, to really help, help the person you're reading it to identify, um, you know, with uh, all sides of the story, to have the numbers, but then also to have that human element uh, to relate to. Um, and then, let me see, and I guess wrapping it up, then, um, yeah, you want to leave them with a kicker of, you know, what do you remember from this? Um, like, again, the why you should care, like uh, what you should walk away with. In terms, so at the end of that story, for example, the last one that I showed, it was, it was a nice happy ending of where they created their own community, even though they weren't accepted by the majority of society, they found safety and inclusion together. So it makes you think that, huh, you know, like uh, this is a, a, a group of people that exist. Maybe I'll change my behavior the next time I, you know, glance at someone and make a judgment. Going back to, I have two questions. Um, going back to what you were saying about that last scene about how the, they found their own outlet in the queer community. Something like that might be considered controversial if it were in a context of an Arab country. Um, yeah. Obviously, something perspiring, like transpiring in New York is different than something happening in the Middle East. Um, so what would, what would something considered controversial in the country that they're in, for example, in an Arab country where um, maybe like queer community isn't very like it's not very out or <laughs> like no pun intended but like it's not very <laughs> it's not very um, like robust or for example something else that's also some some other topic that would also be considered controversial but in the context of an Arab country where it's maybe not considered acceptable or um, you know, it's not as widely, it's just not as widely accepted. Um, how would that look within that context versus like a kind of pulled back context of a community that is formed from members of a community, but out of outside of their own countries or outside of their cultures? Basically, what I'm saying is that it looks different in New York than it would in, in an Arab country. And how would a story like that one, the last one that you showed about the queer community, developing their community in New York, how would that look as if you were to do that story in, for example, Iraq? Yeah, that's thing. I don't think I could. Uh, it's Because that goes back to that refugee camp example where, you know, there's a different risk, you know, that's being faced. I mean, 
uh, in the US, obviously you're able to you know, talk about these things more openly, but uh, you know, and that was like the lead of the story, you know, where sexuality isn't discussed uh, as openly you know, in, uh, you know, in certain parts of the Middle East. And you know, the, Iraq is uh, definitely one of them, where for example, like you'd have to assess the, like, the environment. Uh, I mean, there have been a lot of stories uh, done from Iraq about uh, you know, gay communities and gay individuals, uh, but it's been done with anonymity. You can't, it's, it's like, I, mean, I think um, most people know going in there that there's obviously a risk, a societal risk, um, you know, wh whether from being ousted, you know, to at the time of ISIS, you know, they were th uh, throwing LGBTQ people off buildings, you know, which is an obvious clear threat. That I would not even, t uh, you know, touch that story publicly in, in that sense. But I, I think there's a way, for example, you can work with the person. You, uh, like I was saying, you can do it anonymously so that you're not putting them at risk. Uh, one tool that you can use as a journalist is uh, like when you, uh, the term is called like single sourcing someone uh, or, or, you know, you can't reveal too much about them. You can use as many descriptors as you can without revealing their identity, but still giving, giving them character, uh, making them relatable, but, you know, without saying anything that, uh, you know, puts them at risk. But at the same time, the person or reading or listening uh, can actually connect with that person and you can tell that their experiences are real and you can still convey the story in that sense. Um, yeah, as you said, in the U.S., there's definitely much more freedom. They can have, you know, you can have more of a conversation about it there. I have, you know, much more access. But here, um, you know, I haven't touched any LGBTQ stories, but it's more that what I have done is, you know, if someone in, uh, you know, the LGBTQ community was doing something that was, you know, talking about, you know, uh, maybe addressing uh, men's inabilities to express themselves you know, in society, because it's not as accepted. That's kind of one way to allude to it. You know, I've done those, you know, a bit more openly. Um, and I mean, as you know, uh, recently, I believe, uh, forgive me for not remembering her exact name if I'm wrong, but Sarah Hagazi, one of the, uh, she was someone who had like raised the, uh, like the rainbow flag during the uh, Mashra Leila concert. You know, she'd committed suicide, you know, and she was, I believe, under refugee status you know, in Canada. And, you know, to show the impact of, you know, this is, I, I believe, you know, um, it was from her own family that she felt, you know, the pressure in addition to everything that happened, you know, it's, again, those things that you might not be able to experience your, or understand yourself, but then you see the impact it has on someone else. You do have great responsibility, you know, with uh, the stories that you're telling. So yeah, to, uh, going back to your question, yeah, it's very different, a different environment. Uh, don't rush into it, study the environment you're in before you, you know, take that action to be respectful and also to yourself. Cause I mean, I think, you know, anybody would regret if, uh, you know, they caused someone harm, you know, especially if, you know, they didn't mean to, they were just trying to do, uh, you know, you come in sometimes on your white horse, like, no, 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 let me help you. I know, uh, you know, I have, the, I have uh, the ability to, by telling your story to get other people to connect, but take that time to hear their side and why things matter, what it, um, what, what's involved with their security, their well-being overall, something that sounds, you know, completely sound to you might not be for them. Um, yeah, so just take those into consideration depending on the country that you're in. And does that, um, do you, is the outcome of that more dangerous for you as a reporter or them as a individual in that society or both for different reasons? Yeah, I mean, I would say them, uh, whoever you're reporting about more, because uh, you know, you're telling their story. And of course, um, yeah, I mean, as a reporter, you would, uh, you know, you can get shut down for, you know, saying, depending on the country that you're in, if, you know, it's too anti-government. I think in certain countries, there's a way that you can be critical constructively, uh, you know, depending on the country. In some countries, you just can't, you know, criticize any part of the government in some countries, certain parts of the government. Again, it's just studying the environment you're in. And I think there's always a way to get your message across. Um, like you can use, a lot of the time what I use is nuance, uh, I, you know, context, um, you know, just even someone's existence and you telling someone's story, doing something in a certain environment speaks volumes. So, you know, with, I think when you get that experience and you know uh, what impact those things have, even if you can't be blatant about it, uh, you know, you can still deliver the same story with impact by, you know, using those tools. Um, have you had any experience with governments from like Middle Eastern countries trying to alter or change your stories? 
like they'll allow you to to film or make your story but they want to sort of change the narrative for sure um and again like there are different ways you can handle that a lot of uh, institutions they'll say you know can i see a copy of your entire script or report you know before you put it on the air and they mean well it's not like you know they they want to change anything but it's just that they're i think it, i think personally i think it just goes back to that you know uh arab cultural aspect of you know wanting to make sure they present the right face you know uh, in, in public and society and you know it's uh, it doesn't come to me as a negative thing i just tell them you know sorry our editorial policy is that i can't you know send, copy paste send you what i'm doing or show you the video but you know i can work uh, with you on the facts it's my you know um, goal you know to make sure that you know i represent things accurately and you know some people say yes some people say no um, you know, and then, you know, if someone says, no, I need to see the whole report and have, you know, final say over things and you can respectfully decline to do the story with them. And then they kind of get, understand the relationship, you know, that, you know, the, that you as a journalist, uh, you know, are coming with. Uh, and because like, there are a lot of, you know, media institutions where, you know, they hold an independent name, but then they, you know, all their articles are basically uh pro you know government initiatives they can't say anything critical but i think they you know um the certain people that we work with they once they see our content you know they see that okay that you can be critical but constructively critical and you're not uh you know just you know with a with a wide stroke of a brush you know just uh being uh, you know critical as a lot of the time western media can be about you know middle east issues so I think a lot, a lot of the time it comes once you've developed that relationship at the beginning. Yes. I mean, they, uh, yeah, they, they basically want you to, uh, I mean, not, not all I'm saying, you know, uh, certain ones that may, maybe larger organizations. Uh, I mean, this has happened to me in the U S as well, where, you know, like when you deal with larger corporations and they have their corporate, you know, uh, image that they have to uphold, it's that same feel, you know, where, uh, they want to control the narrative, you know, but you know, maybe it happens in a, a, few, a few more cases here in the middle East. But I think yeah, going on that one by one uh, type basis, you can you can determine if someone is um, willing to work with you, and if both of you don't you know cross the, your red lines about you know uh, you know like uh, jeopardizing you know as a reporter your editorial uh, values, and then for them you know like uh, oh I'm not going to just share all this negative stuff about me and have someone you know lash me with uh, their words, then you know you can tell a good story. How about um, documentary work in the Middle East? Do you have any experience in that? See, I mean, most of my documentaries have been um, from the US, actually about Arab populations there. But um, here, I mean, I don't think it's too different. I mean, it's access is very difficult, I think, or more difficult, uh, depending on what you want to do, like especially in camps, um, if like a lot of, uh, yeah, I mean, also, I think maybe a big thing with documentaries here is uh, using a fixer, which people coming from the outside might have um, difficulty with, because you need someone who can, um, I guess, know the lay of the land. And a lot of the way a lot of things work here is, you know, even if you're coming from, uh, you know, like a, uh, you know, an objective stance, so you mean to do good, you know, the story that you're doing, it's more about like trust. I feel so you need to usually know someone to be able to navigate and like, even even for me like uh, uh, like in Jordan the country that like I know the most you know from the, from the Middle East uh, you know it's it's usually by reference the first thing I'll try and do is uh, you know find someone who knows the community of you know that I'm trying to cover uh, for for a story whether a documentary or uh, you know a, a regular news story and then you know they get uh, through that person they get a sense of my intentions. And, uh, you know, th that's always a good way to enter something because, you know, sometimes just your image, like even for me, like uh, being very westernized, coming in, you know, like with an accent or something, you know, like, oh, he's not, uh, he's not from here. They can, they'll treat you with respect, but just like a little distantly. But sometimes, you know, uh, someone who's from the area, they go, oh, okay, you're so-and-so's friend. Oh, no. And then they show, you know, you they see a bit of your work and then they say, oh, then, uh, you know, then they give you that more access, you know, more of that access. And uh, you get a very different story than you would have if you just walked in, you know, with your journalist flag or mic or whatever, you know, trying to, even though you come in with the greatest of intentions. Uh, in terms of, uh, if you're asking about like on the production side, um, I found actually very uh, good uh, people when it comes to production. I think you just need to guide editorially. 
and uh, even with fixtures as well. Sometimes the, actually we talked about this the last time I think I spoke with Sijal. It's uh, about finding a fixture that you trust as well. Uh, because some, t- some people are just in it for the business. You know, they just, <laughs> as long as they tell you what you want to hear, you know, you don't know what they're saying because you if you don't know the language uh, t- to that extent. Uh, you know, I faced a few uh, cases of that with uh, where I was uh, translating or editing content of uh, foreign reporters who used a fixer in an Arab country and then realized that they ask one question, the fixer asks another, and then the person answers another, and then the fixer translates something else. So it's just like this lost telephone game of, you're like no one answered the thing that the other person was talking about. You don't get the sound bite or the answer that you wanted. So I'd say invest in a fixer that that you trust, that maybe that you've had experience with. And of course, you can't get experience unless you work with them once or twice. Or uh, so I think that's uh, for doing long form, especially where you're depending on uh, someone else's language ability for content. I think that'd be a very useful uh, relationship to have with someone.